الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين First, I would like to thank the Institute of Islamic Thought and Research for their kind invitation <coughs> and also thank the brothers, you know, Hassan, uh, uh, Muhammad Rahman and uh, Shafiq for their also kind uh, uh, words that they've sent to me and they have said today. I'm very grateful for the invitation and uh, I want to thank also the audience for being here uh, for listening to this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, I always try to address the youth. So this is a very warm topic for me because I believe that when one speaks about the youth, we really speak about the future because it's today's youth that will shape our future. And your best guide to the future, our best guide to the future, is to understand our history and to know the present. So what I will try to do today is briefly explore these issues, the history and the present towards my goal. And my goal for this speech is to inspire you. So you become the agent for change, for reform, for progress, not only in your country, but also across the Muslim world. For almost 13 centuries, of what Abu Qasim Hajj Hamad would call the, the first universality of Islam, because I believe we are towards bringing another universality of Islam that we're not there yet, but history is guiding us towards it. But for the first 13 centuries, there was a civilization that at its zenith occupied over a quarter of the land mass across the world. Civilization is usually defined as an advanced state of human society in which a high level of culture, social progress, societal components, legal structures, science, industry, government. This state has this high level of culture has been reached. But this civilization was unrivaled in many respects, including law, philosophy, education, mysticism, science, technology, industry, arts, trade, economy, administration, architecture, medicine, you name it. But even at times of weakness, this civilization was able to defeat and repel the invaders, those who were trying to impact it and occupy it uh, when they descended upon them. They were either absorbed, these invaders were either absorbed like the Mongols when they lacked strong faith to sustain them or were expelled when they had strong faith to retain them like the Crusaders. But by, by, but by the uh, 19th century, the balance of power between the Muslim world and other world powers shifted in the direction of Europe, which had embarked on its own Renaissance after its dark age where reason and faith had collided. With the industrial revolution and the commencement of the age of imperialism, that power gap even widened more, particularly in military technology. Many military campaigns were launched starting with Napoleon's in the heart of the Muslim world in the late 18th century. But even it had failed, this campaign opened the door for monumental changes, not only across the Arab world, but also the entire Muslim world. For centuries, Imperialism invaded the world, created much of its disorder and danger. From Columbus and his comrades, brutal invasion of indigenous peoples in the Americas, to the Europeans looting, pillaging, and colonization of much of Africa and Asia, to the current exploitation of labor resources and markets by unrestrained capitalism and multinational corporations backed up by military power and haughty empires. Colonialists use brute force as well as sophisticated tools for control, domination, exploitation, and hegemony. The cruelty of European colonizers during these military quests was unparalleled. They killed directly or indirectly tens of millions of indigenous people across North and South Af America perhaps as much as 130 million natives, perhaps even 90 to 95% of, of, of these populations before they were invaded. 
By the close of the so-called Indian Wars in late 19th century, fewer than 238,000 indigenous people remained in North America, a sharp decline from the millions that had been living in when Columbus arrived in 1492. Belgium killed perhaps 10 to 15 million Congolese between 1835 and 1840, while the Dutch killed over 300,000 in Indonesia during the same period. France killed over 1 million Algerians during its 132 year occupation starting in 1830. Italians wiped out two thirds of Libyans and over 2 million in Ethiopia while the British starved perhaps as much as 35 million in India during its occupation. Similarly, the Russians exterminated millions in Central Asia, while the new Western Zionist construct in the heart of the Muslim world, Israel call, uh, killed tens of thousands of exiled, <coughs> uh, killed tens of thousands and exiled over 60% of the Palestinians from their ancestral home in 1948, uh, 1948, while taking the entire land and disenfranchising its people in 1967, where millions still live today in squalid refugee camps. Colonizers hid their colonization expeditions under the mantra of spreading Western civilization, carrying the white man's burden, quote unquote. They obscured the real purpose for quest for wealth, control, and power, and domination by calling their campaigns mandates, protectorates, and commonwealth. They used massacres, destruction, and mayhem, not just against peoples and societies, but also against cultures, traditions, history, and memory. They applied all means, ways, and tools. Nothing was beyond the limits or the pale. Divide and conquer, bribe and pamper, kill and lynch, employing all tools of death, especially if one dared to resist. They had the guns and powder, the bombs and planes, the tanks and artillery, and later the media and other soft power tools, including cultural, ideological, and institutional means for domination, massacring, oppressing, starving, torturing, transferring, exiling, enslaving, dehumanizing, raping, pillaging, looting, all in the name of the white man's burden to liberate dark-skinned people. Oftentimes, colonizers came with the aura of the Puritans and civilized people, moralizing and evangelizing, civilizing or de democratizing, but with the gun in one hand and the Bible in the other. The justification for dehumanization and crushing of dignity and spirit was ready by claiming that their victims feel no pain, that the only language they understand is force, that the black man's brain is different, that the other races, be it African, Asian, Arab, Indian, Persian, Afghani, or Bengali are inferior, that they are barbarians, fanatics, racist, uh, radicals, fundamentalists, terrorists, backwards, extremists, ignorant and uncivilized. That they don't respect their women or recognize law and order and can't be trusted. Any resistance or opposition to the colonization project must then be crushed and annihilated, destroyed and obliterated. The British governor of Bombay in 1875 wrote, and I quote, we hold India by the sword, unquote. More than a century later, an Israeli prime minister said in 1988, amidst the first Palestinian uprising against Israel's brutal military occupation, quote, the Palestinians must be crushed like grasshoppers and their heads smashed against the boulders and walls. As lands were raided and occupied, resources looted and plundered, labor exploited and enslaved, social orders were callously altered and cultures destroyed in the name of Western civilization. A campaign of culture imperialism as Edward Said called it was in full swing. Languages, 
traditions, customs, religious beliefs, social practices were attacked and belittled. Cultural institutions were restructured and societies reorganized and divided along religious lines, ethnic groups, and racial castes. To dominate and control, they divide us. Arab against Berber, Turk against Arab, Kurd against Turk, Black African against Arab African, Arab against Persian, Sunni against Shiri, Maronite Christian against Orthodox, Pashtun against Bengali, Tajik against Uzbek, Burjabi against Sindhi, Muslim against Hindu, Jew against Muslim, Muslim against Christian, in a society where all these communities largely live peacefully and in harmony for centuries. Artificial borders across Africa, Asia, and the Muslim world were drawn and redrawn in London, Paris, Brussels, Berlin, Rome, St. Petersburg, or later in Washington and Moscow. Hollywood, this intimidating global university shaped our perception of the master and our understanding of the self and the other. For example, I remember how the movie Midnight Express in the late 1970s shaped my perception of Turkey and fear of the Turks for a long time because of its portrayal of the Turkish people as brutal, heartless, oppressive, and mean. Thousands of books, movies, sitcoms, novels, and programs have been produced not only to poison the minds of white men and women and inoculate them against brown and black skinned people, but also to hijack the positive self image of the others and colonize them as they would forever feel inferior. Furthermore, new legal structures were erected and imposed. The new education system were built and nurtured based on Western notions of ideas, knowledge, history, science, philosophy, and law. For centuries, colonialism was a hammer that saw every colonized community as a nail. But as Franz Fanon once said, and I quote, in the colonial context, the settler only ends his work by breaking the native when the, when the latter admits loudly and intelligibly the supremacy of the white man's values, unquote. As one example, as an example, one could examine the impact of this within the context of the Arab society's encounter with colonialism. Ever since Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt in 1798, the relationship between the West and the Arab Muslim East has been contentious and convoluted. Although this military leader of the first French Republic conquered Egypt for strategic reasons in his rivalry, rivalry with the British and the Ottomans, the Muslim Arabs of this region later dubbed the Middle East by a, an American naval officer felt vulnerable, exposed, and weak. So because of the military power gap, it was relatively easy for the French expedition to take over Egypt. But what proved to be hard was to keep this strategic piece of geography. Egyptian resistance to this early imperial invasion was ferocious. Within three years, Napoleon had to abandon his dreams and withdrew. But the immediate consequence of this brief interaction between East and West had a tremendous long-term impact. French laws and courts, as well as educational and administrative systems with their strict secular outlook were introduced and slowly dominated the public discourse. A new class of elites was created that was tied to the much wealthier and technologically advanced European foreigners after the attempt by Egypt's new governor, Muhammad Ali, to establish a strong modern Egypt was thwarted and rolled back by the British. By the early 20th century, many countries across the Middle East were either under direct European colonial rule, like Algeria in 1830, Tunisia in 1881 by France, or Egypt in 1882 and Sudan in 1896 by the British or Libya in 1911 by Italy. By World War I, the rest of the Middle East came under direct colonial dominance or influence as the Sykes-Picot Accord of 1916 
divided the sphere of influence and direct occupation between Britain and France with Iraq, Palestine, Transjordan, and the small Czechdoms from the Gulf falling to the British and the Levant, Syria and Lebanon going to the French. The significance of the religious and cultural aspects of occupation did not escape the colonialist powers. Upon entering Jerusalem in December 1917, British General Edmund Allenby remarked, the wars of the Crusaders are now complete, unquote. While French military general Henry Garou, who conquered Damascus in July 1920, stood at Salah al-Din's grave, kicked it and said, and I quote, the Crusaders have ended now. Awake, Salah al-Din, we have returned. My presence here consecrates the victory of the cross over the crescent. Furthermore, by November 1917, British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour issued the declaration which pledged British, uh, Britain's full support to the international Zionist movement in establishing national home in Palestine for the Jewish people as soon as a <coughs> British control over the country was achieved. For the next half century, most Arab societies were engaged in national liberation and resistance movements against colonial powers, leading to national independence for many Arab countries between the 1940s and the 1970s. In addition to the national liberation struggle that spread across the Arab world, throughout this period, another parallel conflict in Palestine between the Zionist movement and the Palestinian and Arab people was taking place, eventually leading to many wars in 1948, 56, 67, 73, 78, 82, the Intifada between the 87 and 91, or the second Intifada 2000 to 2003, or the Israeli bombardment of Lebanon in 2006, or against uh, Gaza in 2008, 9, 12, and 14. The direct impact of the 1948 and 67 wars was the displacement and exile of over half of the Palestinian population in many countries outside Palestine, but especially in refugee camps in Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. Their number now exceeds 7 million people. While Israel was established in 1948 on 78% of historical Palestine, by 1967, Israel was in total control of not only all of Palestine, but also of the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula and the Syrian Golan Heights. The direct effect of the 1973 war were not just effectively taking Egypt out of the Arab-Israeli conflict in exchange for returning the Sinai in Egypt with limited sovereignty, but more importantly, consolidating the Israeli occupation over the occupied territories, particularly the West Bank and the Golan Heights. In 2005, demographic and security considerations for, forced Israel to withdraw, to withdraw from Gaza, which is incidentally less than 3% of historical Palestine, which has about 2 million people, mostly descendants of the 1948 refugees. But they did that in order to consolidate Israel's control over the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Today, they were, <clears throat> there are over 130 Israeli settlements and 110 outposts and other colonists occupying almost 80% of the land and 90% of the aquifers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem with as many as 800,000 Israeli settlers living on these lands. With the Trump Netanyahu's plan, better dubbed as the steel of the century, we come to full circle with the true nature of the Israeli state, a fully open settler colonialist project in the heart of the Arab and Muslim world, sticking its tongue to everyone in defiance. Not surprisingly, after each major war, a new Arab political order was established. Before the 1948 war, the Arab polity was dominated by a facade of elite parties that adopted the liberal democratic traditions of the colonial powers and dominated 
by the bourgeois class, especially in the countries surrounding Palestine, namely Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. After the 1948 catastrophe, many of the Arab system of governments with the exception of Saudi Arabia, the sheikhdoms, the Gulf sheikhdoms, Jordan and Morocco, replaced monarchies or tribal systems with republics and revolutionaries. Socialism replaced capitalism in many Arab societies as a new class of elites dominated by the military was established. But these socialist republics soon lost their legitimacy in the wake of the disastrous 1967 defeat to, re to be replaced with a new Palestinian national movement led by many Palestinian resistance factions under the, Palest the Palestinian Liberation Organization umbrella. In short, since the end of World War II, the Arab societies conferred political legitimacy on the regimes and movements that confronted the Zionist project in the heart of the Arab world and Israeli aggression and expansion. In the wake of the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon, the struggle for the Palestinian national resistance movement dominated for two decades by secularist and leftist groups came to a halt. Within a few years, the composition of the resistance movement slowly transformed during the first intifada between 1987 and 91 to be dominated by the Islamic movements, namely Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and Hezbollah. By the end of the second intifada between 2000 and 2003, which effectively exposed the flawed Oslo so-called peace process, the transformation was complete. After 18 years of fierce resistance, Hezbollah defeated Israel, which had to withdraw from South Lebanon in 2000. In addition, Hamas was the biggest beneficiary of the 2005 Israeli withdrawal from Gaza, since no political cost was associated with that withdrawal. Soon Hezbollah and Hamas dominated Lebanese and Palestinian politics with the former dominating the, the Lebanese Palestinian, the, the Lebanese political discourse while the latter winning the Palestinian elections in 2006 and subsequently taking over Gaza in 2007. The political legitimacy of the Islamist groups was further consolidated in the Arab collective memory when Israel failed to defeat the Islamic resistance movements and groups in 2006 war against Hezbollah and the subsequent wars against the Hamas government in Gaza in 2008, 9, 12, and 14. Although Israel caused massive deaths and destruction in these wars, it could not exact a political price on its nemesis. In these conflicts, it was demonstrated to peoples across the region that Israel, which imposed its policy and policies by force on most of the impotent Arab regimes, could not dictate its ultimatums against these popular movements. By the end of the first decade of the 21st century, frustrated citizens across the Arab world had had enough. Corrupt and weak regimes that stole hundreds of billions by looting their countries while relying on ruthless security state, Western humiliation in Iraq and Afghanistan, untamed Israeli aggression and arrogance, economic stagnation and senseless violence by extremist groups like Al-Qaeda and Daesh that don't represent the aspirations of the people across the region. Meanwhile, they see countries in such uh, regions as the Middle East, such as Turkey, Iran, and even Israel developing economically and progressing in many fields while their societies either stagnate, talking about Arab societies, or even go backwards. The political horizons against <coughs> these movements and across the Arab world were closed shut. In November 2010, the Mubarak regime in Egypt even brazenly held parliamentary elections that resulted in no seats to any opposition group. In many countries, regimes that supposedly came through free and fair elections were dismissive of their citizens' aspirations and concerns. They even started preparing their societies for their son's succession 
or family rule, including in Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and Tunisia. These are the so-called of the Arab Spring countries. And even before that, in Syria, and of course, in all the monarchies across the Arab world. As the Arab world was boiling, all that was needed was a spark. It came when a frustrated Tunisian vendor was prevented from selling his goods and suffered humiliation by a police officer and set himself on fire in December 2010. As Lenin once said, there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happen. That's what we witnessed in 2011. Within days, a revolutionary spirit engulfed Tunisia and resulted in Ben Ali, its dictator of 23 years, fleeing the country after 28 days of uprising. Soon the same spirit inflamed Egypt as millions took to the streets, forcing the ouster of Mubarak, its dictator of 29 years after only 18 days. By February 2011, tens of thousands of people in Yemen, Libya, Morocco, Jordan, and Bahrain were in the streets demanding freedom and change and were soon to be joined by thousands of Syrians in March. What was once unthinkable became routine. Within 18 months, four regimes were toppled and democratic elections were taking place. The revolutions and transformations taking place in the Arab world were nothing short of remarkable. But soon the counter-revolutionary forces in collusion with Western imperialist powers viciously overturned all the gains of the Arab Spring nascent phenomena, crushing any hopes for the end of repression and corruption or aspirations for democratic governance and economic prosperity. This was not only a betrayal of declared values and principles by Western powers. It was a continuation of its legacy to dominate and control, to disrespect the will of indigenous people and to deny their right to freedom, dignity, equality, self-determination and expression. History is a witness. For over six decades, whenever the people in Muslim societies tried to assert their peaceful democratic rights, their will was suppressed and reversed. It happened in Iran in 1953, in Algeria in 1992, in Palestine in 2006, and in Egypt in 2013. But this isn't, this isn't even the full story. The picture is even more bleak and the future is uncertain, your future. We're living in a volatile time with all the ingredients of major eruptions before us settling down. Even though the youth constitute perhaps more than 50% or over 50% of the world population, about 90% of them are in developing countries, most of them across the Muslim world. There are 400 million Arabs and as much as 550 million across the Middle East, which includes Turkey and Iran, or even 900 million Muslim between Afghanistan and Indonesia. Perhaps as much as two thirds of these populations are under 30 years of age. That yet they have little or no say about their future. In the Arab world, over 60 million people sleep hungry every single day. Over 130 million are under the poverty line. Same in Bangladesh. The poverty rate is over 20%. Perhaps <clears throat> tens of millions of people also may go hungry every day. Illiteracy rate run from 30 to 50%, depending on the country or the region, particularly among women. Corruption is rife. In 2015, as an example, it was estimated that over 600 billion Egyptian pounds, which was about $80 billion at the time, were wasted every year because of corruption. A phenomenon that is widely spread across the Muslim world. Military spending in the region exceeded in 2015, $225 billion just in, in, the, in, the, in the Middle East. They were spent on armaments that are either not used 
or when used, they are used against each other in devastating wars, such as the one we are witnessing today in Yemen or other internal conflicts and strifes. Unemployment among the youth has reached unprecedented levels, somewhere between 30 and 75%, depending on the country. Even though the Muslim world is not poor, wealth is squandered and concentrated in the hands of the few and corrupt. In the 2008 crash, Arab sovereign funds constituted about $1.2 trillion that were invested in the American economy. And instead of investing it across the Muslim world, they were invested there in the most advanced economies, and that's only in the US. In 2008, this wealth overnight lost $500 billion. Just imagine what could have been done with this money across the Muslim world. What we need is a new vision, a new power structures. Work powers are greedy. Multinational corporations are greedy. They have brought much misery that have greatly impacted the world, particularly against young people, young people of color, women. Since World War I, which is just a little over a century ago, it's estimated that since then over 200 million people were lost, sacrificed to wars, including 20 million in World War I, 55 million in World War II, 3 million in Vietnam, 1.3 million in Afghanistan, 1 million in the Iran-Iraq war during the 1980s. Most of these conflicts were fueled by the West, hundreds of thousands in Bosnia, millions in Africa. As a, my previous, uh, the previous speaker spoke about refugees, and he said there are over 75 million refugees and displaced persons in the world. They are mostly in the Muslim world. This is an acute problem that needs to be addressed. If these people are not settled, that means these people are suffering. That means their normal, their life has been <coughs> stopped and impacted. Poverty across the world is over 50%. That means over 3.5 billion people live under $1,000 a year. And of those there are within that uh, composition, 1.2 billion who are children and 1.5 billion who are women. A billion of them go hungry every night. 25,000 people every single day lose their lives because of poverty or hunger. They die, mostly children. 80% of the world population live under $10 a day. That's 5.5 billion people. While the richest 100 people, just 100 people across the globe own about 25% of the world's income. Just imagine that figure. 100 people across the world get 25% of the world's income. We live in an unjust world. In the US, the richest 0.1, 0.1%, that's one out of a thousand, have over 20% of the country's wealth. And the richest 10%, that's one out of 10, own 50% of that country's wealth, while the poorest 40% own nothing. Look at the issue of global warming, which threatens the existence and continuation of human life. The world spends over $2 trillion on defense and armaments that propagate war and destruction and leave and leave uh, and leave intact the issue of global warming, which may devastate life as we know it. In short, the rich and powerful control the destiny of billions of people in the world. In the words of George Orwell in his powerful novel 1984, we have words being mixed. In his words. War is peace, freedom is slavery, and ignorance is strength. That's the world that we live in today. 
The United States send, sends its military to devastate Afghanistan and Iraq and other places in the name of peace. War is actually peace. These are the, the type, the warp type of, of life we live in, of words, of mixed up words. The US passed the Patriot Act and sacrificed freedom and privacy for its citizens in the name of the defense of freedom. Freedom is slavery. While the world governments and powerful corporations continue to shut down free media, censor news, you can't even use some of the words on social media today because of this power of social media, because they do not want dissent. Ignorance is strength. The Arab Revolutionary Movement in 2011 inspired millions. I remember very well, I was in the States at the time where the Occupy movement came about in the US in 2011, where hundreds of uh, city centers were occupied by these people, hoping for real change. They were inspired by these movements across the Arab world. Millions took to the streets. But these movements, including the Arab Spring, were met with counter-revolutionary forces and stifled that kind of change. All the reactionary forces in society aligned against them because this change, this reform would have altered the power structure, which is based on political tyranny and economic exploitation of the few towards the many. What we need today is a reform in thought that reconciles tradition and human progress to be authentic <clears throat> yet innovative. We need to build a civilizational model, a paradigm <clears throat> that is based on universal values, truth and justice, grounded in Islamic tradition and culture and willing to embrace the human race for the emancipation of mankind towards a just, free, and peaceful world, where these values are held in esteem, justice, freedom, equality, peace, for all, not for the few or the rich or the powerful. We need to bring about a project that will change our conditions where we live, as the Quranic verse says, that God does not change the conditions of the people until they change their conditions. It's a prerequisite that for that change to come, we have to change ourselves. As youth, as people who are embarking on this world in, our, in, in, in your early years, you need to revolve around this notion of change. You need to change your conditions so that God can allow for the reform, for the change to take place across not only your own countries and in all societies, but also across the Ummah. We need to revolve around a grand project that will change significantly the conditions of this Ummah. You have to define your project. Every society, every community must define its own project, must embrace, but that project must embrace the values of justice, equality, and good governance. It must struggle against tyranny, injustice, exploitation, and corruption. The grand project must focus on defeating the arrogance, hegemony, and control of great powers over the world. What I'm arguing today is that we need to unite the Muslim Ummah by having a local project and a grand project. The local project will try to change the conditions of the people within their own communities and societies by embracing these values of justice, freedom, equality, good governance, the notion of ihsan, which will impact their lives directly. 
But we also have to embrace the grand project where all members, all bodies of the Ummah will have to work on as part of that these cannot be individual projects, but they all have to come to a grand project that will focus on defeating that threat, that <clears throat> structure that keeps this tyrannical and, in, and, and, and just structures in place. This grand project must focus on defeating the arrogance, hegemony, and control of great powers over the world. The best manifestation of this the best measure of this is what's in Palestine. It's the best symbol of this struggle. It's not because the Palestinian struggle is unique. Certainly the suffering of the Palestinian people <clears throat> is not much different from the suffering of other people across the globe, whether in Syria, in Kashmir, in Afghanistan, in, 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 the, in, in Burma, with the Rohingyas or others. But the symbol of this is because of what Israel represents as the victory of the other over this Muslim Ummah to keep it fragmented, divided, weak, exploited. Israel was created to symbolize, to symbolize this weakness and division of the Muslim Ummah and to keep it as such. Therefore, the grand project that we must <coughs> adopt and embrace <coughs> Is that when to 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 uh, to show the victory of this ummah to bring it back together? The best measure is the dismantlement of the state of Israel. That is the ultimate goal: to restore our unity and dignity, truth and justice, peace and harmony. And by that, I'm not arguing that this is a conflict between Muslims and Jews. Far from it. Jews are part and integral of this ummah, and they always been. In fact, this project to dismantle the state of Israel is to save Judaism from the destructive forces of Zionism, which is trying to redefine Judaism as an ethnic group rather than as a great religion. And therefore, what we are fighting here, the embodiment of all the ills that before the world today, oppression, tyranny, occupation, racism, apartheid, uh, the, 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 the hegemony of, of powers, regardless, all these notions are represented today by Israel. And it was created in the midst and the center of the Muslim Ummah in order to keep it as such, divided, fragmented, weak. And by aligning all the resources, not only of the Muslim world, but indeed the whole free world, those who value freedom and justice, by defeating this, by restoring the rights of the people, this will be the symbol and the measure by which we can say that we are changing the world to a new world order where justice, freedom, equality, and genuine peace are the values that are held dear, not hegemony, control, and exploitation. Now, let me conclude by saying that for these two projects, the local project and the grant or global project to take place, we need special people. We need the youth to stand up and take its position towards leading this struggle towards universal justice and universal freedom and universal truth and universal peace, but not any youth. There has to be, when I'm talking about people who come from Muslim countries, I would like to suggest 15 perhaps ways by which we can build this generation that can embrace this project by which we can change the conditions of the Muslim Ummah both locally and globally. My first advice or suggestion for the youth is that you must know yourself. If you want to embark on a, a movement where this movement has grand goals, it needs to change, not only locally and nationally, but also universally. First, you need to know yourself. You need to know your strengths, make them stronger, and weaknesses deal with them. 
everyone has some weaknesses, some addictions. Know what your addiction is, deal with it, get rid of it. Empower yourself through education, seek knowledge, study history, acquire skills, experience, enrich your mind to develop and grow. This is your first step. You have to know who you are, what you represent, what you know, your strengths and weakness. My second advice to you is to acknowledge once you identify the, your shortcomings and mistakes, to acknowledge them. Acknowledge your mistakes and shortcomings. Be humble, self-correct, move forward. Learn from your mistakes. Adhere to the dictum, what doesn't kill me, make me stronger. Don't be arrogant or haughty. Be humble in your approach. Be balanced. My third piece of advice is to never ever give up or be afraid of failure. Most inventors failed hundreds of times before they were successful. Have a spirit of perseverance. Remember the saying of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, victory or success is achieved through the perseverance of the last hour. Patience, perseverance become great values that you must adhere to. They will help you as you grow, as you progress. My fourth piece of advice is to have direction and focus in your life. Work for a noble cause, something bigger than yourself, something that will benefit others, your countrymen and women, our ummah, humanity, volunteer, adopt a cause, be active, be mission oriented, not self-centered. My fifth piece of advice is to make common cause with millions around the world. If we're going to seek a new civilizational model, a new paradigm, a new universality of Islam, this is not going to be about us, about Muslims. This is going to be about the progress and future of humankind. We need to bring all these forces of good together. That's why we need to make common cause with millions around the world. Think as a global citizen for yourself, your family, your neighbor, community, nation, the ummah, humanity. Purify yourself from selfishness, ego, and greediness. My sixth piece of advice, to be strategic in your thinking. Think big, think globally, even when you act locally. To be strategic in your thinking is like a chess player and a backgammon player. The chess player understands the strength and power of his pieces, assesses the moves, measures the actions of his opponent and thinks ahead. The backgammon player, on the other hand, moves his pieces according to the roll of the dice. My seventh piece of advice is to have a critical mind to think logically and rationally, to acquire critical thinking skills, question everything, verify all assumptions and check all premises, demand proofs and evidence, have an inquiring mind, reject myths and flawed arguments, question authority, speak truth to power, this is, of course, not easy. It's the mission of prophets. Prophet Musa challenged Pharaoh. Jesus stood up to the Pharisees. Prophet Muhammad defied Quraysh and liberated the world. My eighth piece of advice is that the greatest asset you have is exactly the same that everyone else has, and that is time. It's the most precious thing you've got. Don't waste it. Don't squander it. Take advantage of it. Use it wisely. Organize yourself and your time. Don't waste it on wasteful things. This is something that you have, and when it goes, it doesn't come back. Use it wisely. My ninth piece of advice to you, to the youth, 
is have rules in your life and follow them. Pick a role model, a good leader. Understand the true concept of unity. Don't be a loner or a rebel in your own community. Understand what leadership means as well as what fellowship. My 10th piece of advice is always act with dignity and show respect and tolerance to your friends and colleagues, even worthy opponents. Understand the value of family, of birr al the proper treatment of parents. If a person cannot deal properly with his or her family and parents, then how can they deal with the world? Recall the dictum, love for your brother and sister, what you love for yourself. My 11th piece of advice is to check your prejudices, reject your sectarian thinking, your racist conduct your sexist behavior. This is something that is difficult, but it's not insurmountable. It is something that you could do when you work on it. Be aware of them, deal with them. And there are many good examples of such that one could follow. My 12th piece of advice is to always challenge yourself. Hold yourself accountable. Evaluate your work, your performance. Remember the saying of Khalifa Umar, Hold yourself accountable before you are accounted before the Lord. Measure what you do. My 13th piece of advice is to be spiritual in your life. Strengthen your faith. Develop a conscience that will guide you towards a value system and an ethical conduct that represent the highest ideals in life. Tawheed, justice, freedom, equality, fairness, cooperation. Peace, ihsan. Faith is not about individual rituals. It's not about how many raka, how many times you pray, or how many days you fast, or how much money you give. It has to be reflected on your own personality as you behave with others. It has to be embracing this social system that puts at the center of it the relationship with God, the relationship with other human beings, the relationship with other creations. These are the three dimensions that you must keep in mind. Your relationship with God based on Tawheed, your relationship with the others based on Tazkiyah, the proper conduct, and your relationship with the universe based on Imran. This is the wholesome relationship that must be established, not simply a relationship with God in a very narrow sense. Think about death, that this life is transitory. We're not here living forever. Whatever number of years you live here will be gone in no time. But think about what legacy you want to leave behind, how you want people to remember you, what kind of service you want to do so that you will be remembered in a good way. My 14th piece of advice is to be close to the Quran. These are God's last words to humanity. They mean something. These are not just to bring you barakah, blessings, whether in this life or the hereafter. They are to be read, to be comprehended, to be acted upon. Read it, know it, study it, act upon it. Yes, you'll be close to Allah through prayers and other rituals. But if that conduct is not reflected, in your daily dealings with other, then this is not going, this is not working. But the Quran is the greatest source of strength and power you could ever have. When you acquire it at a time of ease, it will help you at a time of hardship. My final piece of advice is what I started with, is that you need to embrace a major cause that you will center yourself around, where you can make a tremendous impact on changing your society and then make a common cause with a much bigger cause that will impact the Muslim Ummah and globally. And I suggested in this case is to center around geopolitical conflict taking place in the heart of the Muslim world. Either we were going to have a corrupt hegemonic force controlling the Muslim Ummah from its center, or we have to re-establish a new world in which the Muslim Ummah will take its position its rightful position.
in a new universality. To achieve these, we need three factors of success. We need to establish a consensus of vision. We have to build that vision, what project you wanna be involved in locally and what is the global project. We need a will and you need action. We need a thoughtful and clear vision, a determined and decisive will, an ethical and profound action. Great anthropologist once says, she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, concerned individuals can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. You can change the world. Let's go and change the world to be more just, more equitable, and more peaceful. Thank you so much for listening. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, uh, I'm reading the questions. The first questions from the from the <clears throat> sister Tahmina Tawassum. Uh, he asked you, Honorable Sir, we are some of the students of Dhaka University, and most of our teachers started from America, Europe. They are always in pricing of Western. They think the Westerns are the highest level in all side. It's obviously true that Westerns and Europe's social security, political system are powerful than ours. But we know their history, how did they come to this highest level? Now, my question is, in which outlook we will observe the Westerners what should be our notion about them, sir? Well, certainly uh, we should not be against the West because they are the West. We look at the West in, in, in a very open way. There are certainly many uh, segments within Western society where people are trying to be guided by universal values, such as the ones I, I mentioned, justice, fairness, equality, human rights, democracy, uh, uh, and those we embrace. And there are uh, certainly many uh, uh, disciplines by which we can benefit. There are certain things which are not necessarily uh, ones that will, will, uh, will bring uh, up much opposition. Uh, I think we need to differentiate between the good and the bad in every civilization, and we cannot just simply give them the same score. Uh, certainly, even within the Muslim civilization, I'm talking about history speaking, there are parts of it that where uh, people that were not adhering to the highest levels or the highest values of their faith, and therefore we condemn that. And when we look, but overall, when we look at Western civilization, what I tried to outline in my speech was the, the, the prevalent uh, policies that impacted the Muslim world and the world at large in a way that was devastating. When we talk about 200 million people dying in a, in, in a matter of a century, uh, you know, World War I and II were not initiated by the Muslim world or by Muslims. They were initiated by the West and basically for power and geopolitical power. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, almost um, 3 million people in Vietnam, this was not about democracy or freedom that were killed in the 1960s by the United States, devastated. When we talk about 1 million or 1.3 million people in Afghanistan, this has nothing to do with uh, any good notion. This was again, a brute force. When we talk about the history of the United States with 220 plus years of its 240 years being in wars, uh, we're talking today about the longest war the United States has ever had in Afghanistan. These, uh, these are bad reflections on US policy. On the other hand, US also has made a lot of progress in many fields in medicine and others in education. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't mix these two things. We should be very clear on what we think is something that will advance human uh, uh, civilization and the things that will impact it and affect it. But, uh, 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 and, and we should be very clear about that. What's, you know, the racism that uh, uh, that established much of what's taking place today in terms of the black-white re relations or what happened to the American, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the natives, the original people who lived in the United States or they lived across uh, the American continent. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, people have to acknowledge this. People have to acknowledge the wrongs that have taken place and that cannot substitute for that. And uh, same thing could be said about other, uh, other, other, um, 
um, countries and other uh, uh, ex experiences. Thank you very much, sir. We have uh, the second questions uh, from Brother Jubai Hussain, Changi University. I would like to ask a questions in the context of our country. In our country, there is an internal conflict among all the Islamist organizations and institutes do, doing takfir, dominating, showing superiority to other groups are most common here. As a result, we can't be Ummah-centric and can't identify our real enemies. Well, of course, this is part of the problems that Muslim societies suffer from. And I think I try to identify in my uh, 15 suggestions or pieces of advice that we need to deal with them. That comes under this category where we have to know, first of all, our weaknesses. You know, uh, certainly those who try to live in a superior way, they certainly did not understand their faith or dealt with it uh, uh, in, in a proper way. Uh, we have seen also many of the so-called Islamic movements uh, presenting themselves with ideas and projects which contradict inherently with Islam, as we have seen in, in Iraq and other places. Uh, so we have to evaluate these kind of uh, groups and their conduct according to uh, the, the proper understanding of the faith of Islam. Now, those who try to portray themselves as superior and that they know everything, we certainly can engage with them in a conversation, a discussion, a debate to show them that this is a problem. This, is not, this isn't proper. That there are certain, certainly uh, uh, guidelines that will get will tell us, you know, where things are. Um, I can't particularly answer any any of these groups until we identify what, what it is. But I understand the the the. Uh, the flow of the question, which is, you know, there are many Islamic groups. When you really go and talk with them, you will find that their understanding of Islam is really uh, quite limited, and in many uh, in many cases, could be even destructive. And sometimes these groups are created; these are not authentic groups. These are groups that are created, financed, and pushed by other forces in order to uh, destroy the image of Islam, try to uh, um, uh, distort it. And, and and so that people will 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 uh, will stay away from it. And I've seen that uh, in many countries, including in Western countries. So we have to be very wary. Who are these people? What they represent? What is their understanding? And in a repressive society, uh, that's easy to have because when you don't have really real atmosphere where you can engage in debate and discussion, then and and then the the political forces only push one trend to have the, 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 the air or the space, uh, then we, 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 we have uh, difficulty in identifying the good from the bad. Thank you very much, Ustas. Uh, the third questions we have here uh, from Hisham al -Numan. He asked about, I want to know the education system of Palestine. At present, what is the situation of his students, teachers, and his scholars? How growing up to face the upcoming challenges to protect the land of Palestine? Well, first of all, when we talk about Palestine, we don't have a free country. What you have is an occupied country. And within that country, uh, you have different systems. Uh, certainly, <clears throat> Israel as the occupying force uh, try to have or to impose its own system. Uh, but of course, at the end of the day, uh, it has given that uh, uh, role to the so-called Palestinian Authority, which moved into some parts of Palestine, particularly in the West Bank and Gaza, which represent, by the way, the, these areas represent less than 10% of historical Palestine. Yani, we don't really, the West Bank is not really under Palestinian control. It's only the towns. The, and in a very limited way, and only in areas where Israel uh, will have an indirect control, not direct control, but in, in not in a very uh, uh, significant ways. So the educational system com comes under this structure. So when we talk about the curriculum, for instance, that is being taught in Gaza or in Jenin or in Nablus or in Ramallah on some of these Palestinian uh, cities, uh, they will be 
pretty similar to what's going on around the, across the Muslim, the Arab world. Uh, perhaps closer to the Jordanian curriculum because Jordan was in charge. And in Gaza, probably closer to the Egyptian curriculum because Gaza was also under one place under the Egyptian. And then when the Palestinian Authority came, they, they brought some of these mostly under those lines, guidelines. They are not, uh, and of course, Israel has the, the overall, uh, you know, its eyes on, on it, and they try always to influence what's being taught. So I wouldn't consider that as being the, the ultimate educational system we look for, certainly far from it. Uh, particularly, as I said, you're under occupation, you really don't have that kind of uh, freedom. And also, when you, there are secularist forces within the structure that try always to uh, minimize uh, the impact of Islam or faith in the in the overall education system. So what you have is a mixed package. Thank you very much, Ustaz, again. Uh, we have four questions here. Uh, questions by Sain Muhammad. Hoja, we are currently living in the era of globalization. At this time, everything from our thinking, planning, habits, are being manipulated. During this time, we humans have become the product of big companies. Our company, our economic and political system is enslaving us every day. The education system teaches us to be the ideal slaves of the company. They are even determining how we understand Islam, the place of liberation. What can we do to free humanity from the shackles of slavery, what will be the principles of the solution in this case, sir? Very good question. <clears throat> I tried to address it briefly though. I think uh, when it comes to the impact of other forces on our lives, uh, whether it's corporations, governments, even religious authorities and others, and it is to enslave people, whether enslave directly or enslave our minds. That's directly impacted by the <clears throat> most important value in, in, in the faith, in Islamic faith, which is Tawheed. So how do we free ourselves is to be true submitters to Allah. The more you become, uh, a, 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 the more you act in this spirit, the more Allah is, 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 is your Lord, the more you are free from other powers and other lords. So you're strong uh, uh, in faith. If you're strong in faith, the, the, the greater your faith is in that principle of Tawheed, the less you will have imp uh, other impacts. For example, I mean, uh, as I said, I alluded to in my speech that everybody has an addiction. This addiction could be destructive or could be minor. You know, people could be addicted to uh, smoking or to drugs or to other uh, uh, behavioral uh, uh, manifestations. You know, they could be uh, uh, addicted to watching TV, to social media, whatever it is, therapy, uh, you know, to, to alcohol, whatever it might be. These addictions that people suffer from, uh, as I said, they could be minor or could be major. Uh, uh, they will interfere in that relationship. Then you become subject to your addiction, addiction, whatever it is. The more you are trying to resist and free yourself from that addiction, then the closer you are of being free. Your total freedom, your 100% freedom, when you are totally free is when there is no other influence in your life except your will. Your will, will. your will will always be stronger and you will be a true embodiment of an slave to Allah. That's the true Tawheed that takes place. Uh, when Allah tried to uh, test Ibrahim and see whether the love of Ibrahim towards his son, uh, was he competing with his love to Allah? So he was asked to go and try to slaughter his own son. Allah was not interested in the blood of Ismail. What Allah was trying was demonstrating to Ibrahim is to see, to test him, to see whether the love of Allah will overcome everything else. And of course, he, uh, he passed the, that test by the fact that he was willing to sacrifice his own son when it comes to competing because he, that son came at an at, at 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 older age 
and therefore he loved him so dearly, and, but he demonstrated that he was willing to sacrifice Ismail to declare his total love and devotion to Allah. So what we need to do is to look for our Ismail's. What our, are our Ismail's in, in our minds in which they are competing uh, with our relationship to Allah? Is it money? Is it power? Is it uh, women or sex? Is it drugs? Is it wealth? Is it a comfortable life? Whatever it is that becomes close, that we become the focus of our life. Then we have in, been enslaved. That enslavement could be little or more. When we free ourselves of all these pressures, all these desires and whims, then we have become truly free. And that means you are not, you are no one's, uh, 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 you are, you're, you're, not, you're under no one else's sub, subjugation except Allah. That's the true, that's the true meaning of Islam, by the way, the true meaning of Muslim, that uh, you are a total submitter to Allah, where you have freed yourself from everyone else. That's the true Tawheed. So when it comes to that, then that's when you want to start uh, checking yourself is what is it that is impacting your life other than that relationship. When you are totally free, then you don't care about anything else. You only care about that relationship with Allah. And that frees all kinds of things for you for, the, uh, uh, for, for changing the world, for reforming yourself and changing the world. Thanks again, uh, sir. We have last questions uh, from Ashik Abdullah, IIUC. We have read many articles and debates on the dialogue of interreligion and the dialogue of intercivilization from social media. We can see different opinion on that. We couldn't find any general view on that. Would you please tell us know about the dialogue of interreligion and the dialogue of intercivilization simply thank you very much again i'm not sure i got everything because the the sound keeps breaking up so i only get part of the question but if i understand it correctly you're looking for resources for yeah uh, the uh, question was about uh, Knowing the dialogue of interreligion and the dialogue of intercivilization. Okay, I didn't get the first one. Intercivilization and inter what? Uh, interreligion, interreligion, and dialogue of intercivilization. Uh, what well, I mean, there are many institutions around the world. I mean, you can certainly look them up, in which uh, they try to engage in uh, Western Islamic or sometimes even Eastern Islamic kind of uh, dialogue or engagement. Uh, I have had, uh, I've established several institutions that do the, just that. Our center, Center for Islam and Global Affairs, SIGA, here at uh, Istanbul Zain University in Turkey. This is one of the things we do. We have an annual conference. It's called uh, the Ummah Conference. Uh, we just finished our fourth conference this past December. And we bring many scholars from around the world in order to discuss things which are related to uh, uh, the Muslim Ummah as well as the relationship or the nature of the relationship between Islam and the West. We also have a conference on Islamophobia in which we try to understand this phenomena and try to see how we can deal with it. All these take, I mean, we have perhaps as much as 600 lectures or speakers rather on our website that you can go and check out it's uh, siga dot um, izu, which is Istanbul Zaim University dot edu dot tr. You'll find hundreds of lectures on that. But also, there are many other studies that you can find. So the resources are plenty. What is missing is not what uh, what is missing is not the thoughts themselves, but I think what's missing is the commitment. And I'm hoping that. Uh, with today's lecture that I have inspired a few of you who would be willing to go and act upon the pieces of advice I laid out and try to come up with a vision to change the society, to change what's happening in your own country, in your own uh, community. And then we'll try to link up all these uh, uh, movements are from around the world for the grand project which is the 
establishment or re-establishment of a more just world where the uh, uh, rich and powerful and the corrupt will not <clears throat> become richer and more powerful and more corrupt at the expense of the uh, uh, of, of the uh, of the others and that's that's what we need and we aim to change inshallah uh, uh, in our life but also in the life of our children and of course in in, in, the, uh, in your lives as as the future leaders of the muslim ummah